Yes, we can. Okay, so I shall begin. So firstly, I should say thank you very much indeed to Tony, who initially contacted me on behalf of the Rotary, and to Suresh, who has been communicating with me. And also, I was not expecting your commemoration of the Holocaust, and I was very impressed with Ron's words. They really moved me, so thank you very much for that as well. And about my presentation, I, I will just say that this is a short version of a longer presentation. Uh, the full presentation is over one hour, and I've been asked to speak for 40 minutes. So I cannot cover everything I want to cover, but I will give you what I can. Uh, my usual audience, the target audience, if you like, is people who are not really engaged with the subject of the climate crisis or the ecological crisis. And uh, I know some of you listening are very knowledgeable about particularly the climate crisis. You probably know more than me. And so uh, if I'm telling you things you already know, then please excuse me. But remember that this is a uh, an introductory talk for people who know very little, and you might like to use it uh, in future uh, for audiences that know very little. Okay, so first a little bit about me. I was born in 1958, and I grew up in the southwest of England in the UK. Uh, this is a picture of me in the middle here and uh, aged one year old, and uh, both of my parents were teachers. We grew up in a small house which was completely powered by fossil fuels. Our electricity was made by burning coal, our fire in the house was burning coal, and our gas was made from coal. So it was a perfectly normal house uh, in England, in the southwest. Uh, so I have worked in nature conservation for well over 30 years, and that work has been recognised. I accepted an MBE for my team at the charity that I helped to set up. But I should say I'm not a climate scientist. Uh, I won't have all the answers to your questions, but I can tell you where I would look for the answer. Okay, so part one, first things first. Good planets are really hard to find. We've identified one million billion planets in the universe, and we've only seen two with an atmosphere and water, and they are K218b and Earth. Just in case you were thinking that K218b is somewhere you could go to live, if things here get too bad, at the speed of light, it would take you 111 years to get there. So we really are totally dependent on planet Earth. So to continue living on planet Earth, what do we really need? Well, planet Earth is only habitable because it has a balanced climate system. So our climate depends on the presence of multi-year ice and permafrost, which we call the cryosphere. Uh, without that, the Earth's temperature would be completely different and our climate would not support the life that we know. We are completely present on the fertility of soils around the world for plants to grow, of course, and for our food. We are completely dependent on the natural movement of water around the oceans uh, water in, in, uh, in, in the sky, of course, the oceans evaporate, water falls as rain, our lakes and rivers are vital for life. We are completely dependent on the ecosphere, uh, on healthy ecosystems, both in the sea and on land. And of course, we are completely dependent on our atmosphere having a good balance of gases. If we lost any of those, Earth would become uninhabitable. So what's all the fuss about? The Arctic and Antarctic are still frozen, crops still grow, it still rains, we still have wildlife, we still have fish in the sea, we can still breathe. So what is all the fuss about? 
Well, if we look at any of those things, we find ice loss is accelerating, crop failures are increasing, droughts are increasing, wildlife decline is, is fast and accelerating. There are still fish in the sea, but fish stocks are very low and declining. Uh, we can still breathe, but air pollution is killing people already. Why are these things happening? Well, part of the reason is the climate crisis. So we'll start to talk now about the climate crisis. Over millions of years, billions of tons of carbon rich organisms, organisms have died and sunk and turned into carbon rich fossils in the ground. So we call these carbon rich fossils, fossil fuels, natural gas, crude oil and coal. And also there are fossil fuels in tar sands, which is bitumen. You might have heard of the tar sands in Alberta in Canada. So when we dig up or pump up these fossil fuels and burn them, uh, we release the carbon contained in the organisms that died millions of years ago. And the release of that carbon is as carbon dioxide, CO2, which goes up into our atmosphere and enhances or increases something we call the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is basically what keeps our planet warm. Without greenhouse gases, the average temperature of our planet would be minus 18 degrees centigrade. The average with greenhouse gases is about plus 14 degrees centigrade, and it has been stable for thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, relatively stable. Uh, and what happens is the solar radiation, the warmth from the sun comes into our planet through our upper atmosphere. Some of that heat is re-radiated by the surface of the planet, particularly the white parts, the snow and the ice. Uh, and uh, some of that re-radiated heat is trapped by the greenhouse effect by the gases in the upper atmosphere. The greenhouse gases are mainly carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. So what's happened with the greenhouse effect is that by releasing carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide, we have increased the amount of insulation that our atmos upper atmosphere is, is giving us and trapped more of the sun's heat so less heat escapes into space. So our temperature is now higher than 14 degrees centigrade average. OK, so the world is a bit warmer. What does that mean? Well, the climate system is very, very sensitive. You only need to increase the temperature a little bit before you get a lot more storms. You get more floods. This is because of more water evaporating from the warmer oceans. We also get more ocean acidification because the oceans absorb a lot of the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and the oceans uh, are now have higher levels of carbonic acid, uh, which, is, uh, which is a problem if you are a shellfish. Uh, trying to grow a shell in acidic water is a very difficult process. And of course, most of the marine food chains involve shellfish of some description. With a slightly warmer world, we also have more droughts, more heat waves and more wildfires. CO2 levels have always got, gone up and down. And you might think that the change now is just part of a natural cycle. If we look at the natural variability of the last 800,000 years, we can see that this, the atmospheric um, CO2 level has varied between about 180 and 270 parts per million. It's currently 415 parts per million. So we have nearly doubled the pre-industrial level of um, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And carbon dioxide concentration does not go up and down on its own. It is very closely linked to variations in global temperature and also variations in sea level. And a lot of very clever scientists have spent many hours trying to determine which drives which. Does CO2 drive temperature or does temperature drive CO2? And the consensus at the moment is that 
temperature difference is driven by the difference in atmospheric CO2 levels. Similarly, uh, with sea level is driven by CO2. Okay, so um, you may have realized already, you may have heard that the sea is rising. Um, and rises in sea level are relatively slow and very, very predictable. There is also a, a time lag between the emission of the carbon dioxide and the rising of the sea. So we can be very certain about future sea level rises. At least we can be certain about the minimum. And uh, there's a website you can go to called Climate Central, where you can see uh, the projected sea level increase uh, up to the year 2050. So this map is showing areas that will be annually flooded. They will be flooded every year within the next 30 years. So significant parts of London city centre will be flooded every year. And huge parts of the east coast of England and parts of the west country in England as well. Um, I should say to you, there are two things that these maps do not take account of. One is sea defences and the other is annual, sur um, sorry, uh, surges in sea level caused by uh, extreme weather. So sea defences will reduce the flooding in some areas. Uh, surges in sea level will increase the flooding at some times. Uh, here we can see Mumbai and you can see uh, Tani as well. If we look at just at Tani, uh, you can see that at least half of Tani will be flooded every year within the next 30 years. And of course, Mumbai and Tani is not the most affected area of India. A much bigger land area will be flooded in Bangladesh. How do we know humans are to blame? We can compare the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere and how that has changed to our CO2 emissions. So if we just look at these curves for the last 1000 years, you can see they are almost identical. As our emissions have gone up, so atmospheric CO2 has gone up. We also know because uh, of the isotopic fingerprints of different types of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, emissions lack uh, carbon-14 and their carbon-12, carbon-13 ratio is different to natural carbon. Uh, I can explain that to you further later if you want me to. Uh, there is no doubt that our emissions are the source of increased atmospheric CO2. There are more than two lines of evidence. I'm just giving you a little bit of the evidence. OK, so the effect of possible CO2 emissions in the next uh, 80 years. You might have heard of RCPs or representative concentration pathways. These pathways here represented as red, grey, yellow and blue lines on the graph. They are created by scientists in order to run computer modeling yeah, to look at the right, effects of the right, temperature right. increases. Yeah, if you're, if you're I can hear somebody else talking. Okay, thank you. So these representative concentration pathways are created by scientists in order to run their computer models looking at the future effects of increases in CO2 level. Uh, and we can see here that um, there's a, a one called RCP 8.5. And this basically is what's called the worst case scenario. If we follow that red line with our CO2 emissions, within 80 years, we will have a global average temperature increase of 3.2 to 5.4 degrees centigrade. That is enough to wipe out most life on Earth. There are multiple sources of evidence for me to say this. They mainly come from the fossil record from previous mass extinction events. There's a one called RCP6, which would result in that temperature increase you can see of above two degrees. And that is enough probably to result in the collapse of civilization. 
certainly life as we know it would would cease to exist if we reach those kind of temperatures. Uh, we might reduce our emissions from about the year 2040 and follow that yellow line, which would mean we would have more of the extreme impacts that we're already seeing. And scientists are agreed that where we need to be is going carbon neutral um, and actually um, following that blue line uh, to get uh, the amount of carbon we are emitting actually into the negative. So we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere by the latter part of this century. That's RCP 2.6. The flood maps I showed you, by the way, were based on 4.5 on that yellow line. If we follow the red line, the floods would be worse. You've probably heard of the Paris Agreement. This is a fantastic achievement. 196 countries, that's nearly all the countries in the world, got together and agreed to keep a temperature increase to well below two degrees. That is a fantastic achievement. But what have the countries of the world actually pledged to do? OK, so let's look at what would happen if the countries did what they said they would do in the Paris Agreement. So here we have a similar graph again. We have our red line showing high emissions leading to catastrophe, catastrophic warming. We have our blue line, uh, which is where we need to be. And in the middle, you can see that gray line. This is where our emissions would go if all of the countries did what they said they would do in the Paris Agreement. The country pledges are far too weak to meet even the two degree target. Scientists, many scientists think that the Paris Agreement would result in a three degree rise by the end of this century. Okay, now the bad news. That is where we were heading last year. How do we know that? Well, we know the amount of carbon that we emitted from industry and from agriculture, for example. We know the figures for 2018, 2019. We know in 2020, we were heading for 44 gigatons of CO2 released. But then we had the pandemic. And it is expected that we will be releasing in 2020 we have released 7% less, which is about 40 gigatons of CO2 uh, less than we would have released otherwise. But that is a temporary reduction. We know that all of the aviation industry is waiting to fly. We know uh, consumption will recover, travel will recover, cruise ships will start to sail around the world, belching out their exhaust fumes. So basically, we are in the longer term on that red line. This means that if we carry on as normal, life as we know it will be over. That's why protesters are saying act now. We need to act on this without any delay. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Planet, um, Panel on Climate Change, have 3,750 3, experts, uh, scientists looking at this, and they say what we need to do starting in 2020 is to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by 45% by 2030 to reach zero by 2050. That's a reduction of 7.6% every year. So even the 7% reduction because of COVID that happened last year is not enough. And we need to be doing that 76 every year. Even that reduction would only give us a 50-50 chance of limiting warming to a relatively safe 1.5 degrees C. If I said to you, outside is a bus and there is a 50-50 chance that that bus will have a catastrophic crash 
would you go and get on the bus? No, you wouldn't go. And that's why 2050 is too late. It is a massive challenge, according to the Secretary General of the United Nations. If we don't manage to stop this warming, we will face total disaster. America backed out of the Paris Agreement for four crucial years. Australia is determined to maintain its coal production. It's the biggest exporter of coal in the world. The UK is not on track to meet its 2023 to 27 uh, CO2 reduction targets. India's CO2 emissions have increased in 50 out of the past 55 years, but I have read that India could be on track to meet its uh, 2030 uh, Paris Agreement targets, uh, which is fantastic, of course, but the Paris Agreement, remember, is not sufficient. Okay, so now for something completely different. The Earth has warmed one degree That's increased the level of the sea Warming makes the sea expand, it rises up and floods the land. At two degrees you can kiss goodbye to Miami and Shanghai. There's 20 million people there, who has that many rooms to spare? By three degrees glaciers have gone, with less polar ice to reflect the sun. Refugees will then exceed a quarter of a billion. At one degree, no surprise, half our coral reefs have died. Such a rich ecosystem, half a billion people depend on them. At two degrees, I tell no lie, lots more coral reefs are sure to die. Corals bleach to a ghostly white, it's happening almost overnight. By three degrees they will all be dead, gone with the life they supported. They'll never ever grow again, you see, with rising ocean acidity. At one degree, land gets hot, though you might think that one is not a lot. Extremely hot days per year increase to four or five. At two degrees, farmers struggle, food supply is really in a muddle. Extremely hot days per year. Average 27 by 3 degrees, the weather's gone mad, food is scarce, things are looking bad. Extremely hot days pay will average 62.
everyone to see We must make sure we don't hit a major tipping point There is a risk we can detect of triggering a domino effect If that occurs there'll be no way of stopping climate change if we don't act decisively to combat warming urgently On our present trajectory we're heading for 3.2um before i go on to talk about the ecological crisis i would just say that since, since that song was written and recorded um nine out of those 15 climate tipping points are now active so they are in the early stages of tipping already and i'll also say that uh, at the end where the song said we're heading for 3.2 that was the mean figure from all predictions uh, it's generally agreed now that we are heading for four, possibly five degrees rather than 3.2. Okay, so let's talk about the ecological crisis. You've seen this image before. All human life exists within the ecosphere. The ecosphere supplies everything we consume. And of course, it was the ecosphere that actually created our atmosphere and our climate in the first place. Without plants, we wouldn't have the oxygen, etc., etc., etc. So all that we know is happening within the ecosphere. Our population is growing. The ecosphere is not growing. So we have more and more people surviving on limited finite resources the amount of the earth's surface which is biologically productive is 24 percent that's 18 percent of land and six percent of the ocean uh, which equates to 12.3 billion hectares so if we divide that 12.3 billion hectares of biologically productive land by the number of people on earth we can see that actually Earth's biocapacity is 1.6 hectares per person. But because of our consumption, we actually are using 2.5 hectares each. That's our ecological footprint. This is why scientists are saying that in order to live sustainably, we would need 1.6 planet Earths. But of course, we only have one planet Earth. Our, the way we live is fundamentally unsustainable. It's never been sustainable since the Industrial Revolution. And not being sustainable, of course, means that it will end. We only prop up our overconsumption by releasing the energy stored in fossil fuels, destroying more and more of Earth's natural habitat and allowing our waste to accumulate in our environment. And the biggest proportion of that waste by weight by far is carbon dioxide. Consequently, we are now in the sixth mass extinction event. So there have been five previously on Earth. The five previously on Earth, most of them happened quite slowly compared to this one. This one is happening incredibly fast. The current extinction rate is up to 100 times faster than the average. Up to a, a million species currently face extinction. And the loss of species and habitat poses as much danger to life on Earth as climate change. The loss of species and habitat poses as much danger to life on Earth as climate change. So even if climate change wasn't happening, we would still have a huge problem. Uh, the source here, by the way, is the intergovernmental uh, platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. That is the um, 
uh, equivalent of the IPCC. What does Sir David say? We are in terrible, terrible trouble. Globally, in your lifetime, vertebrate animal populations have declined by an average of 60% in just the last 50 years. Since I was 12 years old, vertebrate animals, that's the mammals, the birds, the reptiles, everything with the vertebrae, more than half have gone. And the rate of CO2 emissions is incredible. More than half of all the industrial CO2 that has ever been emitted in our entire history has happened since I was 32. Wow. Put these two crises together and what do you get? You get less ice at the poles, so you get less reflection of solar energy, so you have more global warming. You have less permafrost releasing methane, so it means you have more global warming. You have less fresh water, so there's less food production ultimately for people. Soil fertility is reduced by climate change, meaning less food for people. Fewer invertebrates means less food for people. Fewer animals ultimately means less food for people. Less food is a, is a common result. Not everybody believes this and denial has been a huge problem, particularly in the past, but some persists even today. And scientists have looked at denial in the similar way to the way they've investigated any other aspect of uh, behaviour. And uh, they've managed to uh, derive the five um, characteristics of, of denial. Uh, so some denialists try to create the illusion that there is an ongoing scientific debate, that there is uncertainty about climate change, for example, or they jump to conclusions, often the wrong conclusions, or they demand unrealistic standards of proof or claim that the evidence is insufficient. And a very common thing you'll find denialists doing is picking a little bit of data, a small amount of the data, rather than considering all of the evidence. And if they are failing to lose their argument, the final thing they'll often do is to claim that all the scientists are in a conspiracy and they're falsifying the evidence. Actually, denial is rubbish. Uh, the proof of human caused climate change has reached the gold standard. To have 97% of scientists agreeing on something uh, in the natural sciences is remarkable. There is no doubt, uh, really, there is no doubt in the minds of at least 97% of scientists that we are causing global warming and it's all real. But denial is understandable. Uh, some people argue that uh, you're not either a denier or a believer. Uh, we are all perhaps deniers to some extent. Otherwise, how could we start our car or uh, have babies or, you know, perhaps we are all in denial to some extent. But don't feel bad. We need to just get over it. The science is clear. We know what we are facing. What we need now are solutions. So these are the big four causes of emissions. Uh, industry, energy, transport and food. Let's look first of all at energy. Okay, two thirds of greenhouse gas, em gas emissions globally are caused by the energy sector. So this is the biggest one. Energy solutions, we need to use less energy. We need to switch our energy suppliers to ones that are 100% renewable. We need to stop using coal, oil and gas as quickly as we possibly can. We need to switch to alternative source of energy, alternative ways of heating our homes. We could start a local community energy group. Transport. Transport emissions represent 16% of the global total, quite a lot, but most of those emissions come from short journeys that we are all, nearly all, making. 
So transport solutions, avoid flying unless you have absolutely no choice. The emissions from the aviation industry are massive. Stop buying diesel and petrol as quickly as possible. Use public transport, car share, walk, cycle, use an electric cycle or an electric car. Last year, my partner and I bought our first electric car secondhand and we are absolutely delighted with it. It's wonderful. Travel less, use Skype, use video conferencing as we're doing now. Food. Food production is the single largest human pressure on Earth, and it's driving the sixth mass extinction event. It also accounts for a lot of our emissions. Fertilizer, for example, put on agricultural crops is made from fossil fuel. Um, and so you know, agriculture is a major part of the problem. So food solutions, we need to eat a lot less meat and switch to a plant rich diet. If you become a vegetarian, and you were previously a normal meat eater, then you're reducing your food emissions by up to 63%. And if you become vegan, it's even higher. Eat locally produced food in season, eat organic, grow your own, reduce your food waste and compost the waste that is left. Consumerism, we are all in the habit, or most of us are in the habit of buying things that we don't really need. And it causes huge amounts of emissions, 32%. So we need to only buy what we really need. We need to stop buying fashion goods. Don't buy new things unless you really have to. So choose secondhand things, things that can be uh, repaired uh, is a really good idea. Uh, sustainably produced, locally made, fair trade. Avoid plastics. I haven't really mentioned the damage of arising from plastics. That's another subject. Reuse, rehome, recycle. Look after things, repair things. Voting. Now, for those of us that live in a democracy, this is really, really important. We must not assume that our representative is doing the right thing in our House of Representatives or in our Parliament. And if, you if you're lucky, you might find that you can check the way that your MP or your representative is voting on your behalf. Here in the UK, if we just look at the period 2008 to 2019, so that's 11 years, we can look at which political parties have a strong record on voting for measures to tackle climate change and we can look at which political party has a weak record on voting to tackle climate change and from this graphic we can see plainly that our conservative MPs have a terrible track record on uh, voting for measures to tackle climate change. So don't assume that your MP is doing the right thing. Check what they're doing. Okay, so what to expect if we do it all? If we do all the things that I've talked about, what we'll have is more time. A lot of the changes that are coming are inevitable, but there is still time to slow them down. So if we do everything we can, we can buy ourselves, if you like, more time. That'll be more time to adapt to the changes that are coming, more time with our families. And if we do all those things, we will be in better health. We'll have cleaner air, for example. And we will have stronger communities with our community energy schemes, with our community food production, etc. The alternative is nothing. If we want to witness the breakdown of our society, the collapse of civilization, unimaginable amounts of human suffering and death, all we have to do is nothing. Just carry on with business as usual and it will all come to pass, probably sooner than we think. We are all in the same boat. 
We are one global community and we will all be affected. We need to support each other. There is still hope, there is still time to act and we must do everything we can. We need to act now. We should have started that CO2 emission reduction last year. We need to act now for life and for the children of the earth. Let's give our relationship to Earth's crisis the four-way test. Let's see what happens. Is it the truth? Yes, sadly, everything I've told you is true. Is it fair? No, it's unfair to most people. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? No, not unless we act now and come together and start to address these problems. Will it be beneficial? To all concerned absolutely not so what do we actually need to do we need to tell the truth we need to spread this information to everyone we need to make it fair we need to look at equitable changes across different societies different nations to make the world a fairer place to live in if we come together with goodwill and in friendship and act now, then yes, we do stand a chance. Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Well, that's really up to us. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you go to the chat, you will find links to two handouts that I've produced uh, one is a list of action points.